Okay, hi everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. So welcome to another webinar hosted by Mission Cure. Can you believe that our patient webinar series is in its third year? <laughs> wow. Um, we wanna give a special thanks to Avi who has supported our patient education program for the whole three years, including this webinar series. So thank you, Abby. And if you're new to this webinar series, we're so glad that you found us. And if you've been here before, welcome back. My name is Linda Martin and I'm the board chair for Mission Cure. I'm here today with my colleague, Avi Culler, and I'm delighted to welcome the team from Aerial Precision Medicine who will be talking about genetics and medication, how your genes affect the medications you take. You will meet the team from Ariel in just a minute. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes though, before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded. The webinar recording will be posted on both the Mission Cure and Ariel websites in the next day or so. After the webinar today, we will share a handout that Ariel has prepared that includes key takeaways from this webinar. So be sure to look for that. You have joined in listen only mode, meaning we can't hear you. We do want your questions though. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box on your webinar control panel. There will be plenty of time at the end of this webinar for Dr. Adams to answer your questions. But before we get started with our topic today, just a quick overview about Mission Cure. Uh, Mission Cure is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded about three and a half years ago by Megan Golden and her brother, Eric, who had suffered from chronic pancreatitis for years. A few short weeks later, I joined Mission Cure as co-director during a time when my daughter, Amy, was also suffering from chronic pancreatitis she had had severe digestive issues for years, had been misdiagnosed many times, but in the meantime, kept getting sicker and sicker until she could no longer work and could barely get out of bed. With no approved treatments or any kind of therapy to stop or reverse or even slow down the disease, we set a goal to find effective treatments for pancreatitis within 10 years. We're partway into that 10 years and we're making good progress. Mission Cure collaborates with researchers and biotechs throughout the US and abroad. And I am so excited about the advances that are being made, um, new approaches, new discoveries. Um, the Mission Cure team, also another exciting um, initiative of Mission Cure, led by my colleague here today, Avi Culler, is also working to create a new model to improve pancreatitis care and make specialized coordinated care accessible for all people dealing with pancreatitis. We are delighted to co-sponsor this webinar with Aerial Precision Medicine, one of our favorite partners who works tirelessly to advance the understanding of the causes and drivers of pancreatitis and to accelerate pancreatitis therapies. We now know that individuals' genes can affect how well specific medicines work for them, and I can't wait to learn more about this today. This knowledge will help doctors prescribe the most effective medicines for each patient. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Jessica Gibson, co-founder and CEO of Aerial Precision Medicine, who will introduce herself and her team. Thank you so much, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. And, um, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to work collaboratively with Mission Cure in providing these educational webinars and more insights to empower patients and physicians to make more um, patient centric treatment decisions. Um, as Linda mentioned, you know, Ariel was founded um, to meaningfully improve the lives of patients suffering with pancreatitis and all the other associated comorbidities that make this such a challenging disease to not only understand stand, but to develop treatments for. But as Linda was saying, this is a really exciting time. Um, since 2015, when um, I co-founded Ariel with Dr. David Whitcomb, we have made significant progress in both understanding the different biologic processes that interact within a patient to drive um, their pancreatitis or their health needs differently, but also in using these insights to advance the development for new treatments. And I'm so grateful today that Dr. Solomon Adams is able to share um, his 
expertise on um, the way that we select medications, the way that we understand individual patient needs. Uh, Dr. Adams is both a pharmacist and PharmD, as well as um, has PhD in genetics from the University of Pittsburgh, and is really an innovator and a leader in the field of pharmacogenomics. And really excited to hear from him today and grateful to have him participating in the aerial team. Thanks so much, Solomon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jess and Linda, for that oversight. It's, it's such an honor to work with an organization like Mission Cure that has contributed so much um, to people who are suffering from this uh, terrible chronic and, and rare disease. And I'm really excited to talk to patients about pharmacogenomics because what's really interesting about this area, along with many other emerging areas within precision medicine, is the patient focus in deciding what therapies are appropriate for a given disease state. So in supporting patient advocacy for yourself and also what you can do in working with your providers to optimize your clinical care. Before I start, however, I'd like to ask a question of everyone here. And I think I know the answer for most people because most people have taken a medication before. So you have a survey question in front of you and what it's asking is, have you ever taken a medication that didn't work the way you expected it to? I know my answer. And we'll give a few seconds for those to populate and then we'll pop up the results. So not surprisingly, we have a significant majority of folks attending today who have at some point or another had a problem with the medication. Now, the question I ask about that is why? You know, when we design drugs, when we pick doses, decide how to administer a drug and even just choosing which drug to prescribe, we generally do so with some bit of education behind it. So we know generally what doses work for a population. Um, so why wouldn't those work for any individual? We also can think about this in terms of the way that we give a medication. So maybe you took a medication in the morning and it made you drowsy. So it might've been better to give that medication in the evening when drowsiness might not be such an issue because you would be going to sleep anyway. Sometimes we can also consider dosage forms differences. So some medications might work really well if you give them orally, but there might be other instances where that same medication would work more effectively if given intravenously or topically. And then finally, and, and perhaps foremost in most people's mind is, we just chose the wrong drug. So for most disease states, there are many different drugs that can treat the same condition. They might even work the same way, but one of them might not work for one person, which would work fine for another person. So that why is what keeps prescribers, pharmacists, other healthcare providers, and most likely patients, so it keeps us all up at night. What is it that we can do differently to better guide medication decisions? Now, sometimes that answer to that question or what made that medication decision wrong was something simple like the patient has a sensitivity or an allergy that we might not have been able to predict until it was tested, meaning the person took the drug and had an unfortunate reaction. And now we know we're not going to try that drug again. But where clinicians come in and what we think about is, obviously there's significant variability from patient to patient. And how does that mix in with how drugs actually work? So if you think about it in terms of taking an oral drug, so you might swallow a tablet, goes into your stomach where it dissolves and it mixes with fluids in your stomach and your intestine, and eventually gets absorbed and distributed throughout your body. So through that process, your body is trying to get rid of a drug because it's on the outside, it's foreign, and it doesn't think it's supposed to be there. So it wants to metabolize it or break it down. We know that some people metabolize drugs really fast and some people metabolize them really slow. Then some people fall somewhere in the middle. So oftentimes, and you'll hear this later in this talk, we'll define those as things like poor metabolizer, where you metabolize something slower than the average population or ultra rapid metabolizer where you metabolize it faster. We also know that the places that drugs go and bind or inhibit or 
induce in order to elicit whatever response they're supposed to do, those can vary as well. And sometimes that might mean that a person has extra sensitivity to a drug, even if there's no alteration in the rate that they metabolize it. So tracking those individual variations and more specifically predicting them is what we are primarily focused on when we start to think about precision pharmacotherapy based on individual patient characteristics. And it turns out we've been doing something like this for a really long time. So when you're working with a provider to treat a condition that, with a new diagnosis, you're probably going to first talk about what are the therapeutic goals. So if you have high blood pressure, how high is it? And how low do you need it to go in order to be in a healthy range? We might also consider things like patient age, especially when we compare pediatrics with adults with geriatric patients. Clearly, biometrics are relevant. I'm sure most folks have been exposed to weight-based dosing, where people who weigh more might get a different dose than people who weigh less. We might also incorporate things like height. And going further down this inverted pyramid, we also get to more specific individual things. So maybe you have a new condition that you're diagnosed with, and a family member had that. And you know that the family member responded really well to one medication. Maybe that indicates that it might work better for you through the same concept of diseases like pancreatitis having a heritable component. And then finally, where we are now is genetic testing. So how can we consider variations in an individual person's genetics on their variation in drug metabolism or drug sensitivity? Which brings us to this term that I really like talking about because it's my whole world, which is pharmacogenomics. Just a quick housekeeping thing, you'll pretty frequently see this abbreviated as PGX, pharmacogenomics, PGX, and another term that you might also encounter called pharmacogenetics. In most contexts nowadays, all of those are synonymous. By definition, it's field of research, but it's also a very powerful clinical tool that takes genetic test results and applies them to predicting individual metabolism. So binning someone into that poor metabolizer, normal metabolizer, ultra rapid metabolizer category, it also can tell us about how likely it is that an individual person is going to suffer from some adverse drug event or even a minor drug reaction in some cases. In some other cases, it can tell us how likely it is a drug to work the way it's expected to, regardless of drug metabolism. And what's interesting about pharmacogenomics is it's also a very mature field within precision medicine. I would argue one of the most mature uses of genetics in routine medical practice outside of oncology. It's so well regulated or well matured that it has federal regulation through the Food and Drug Administration, which oversees and really dictates what genes and drugs are able to be connected and what recommendations can be given based on those predictions about how the drug will act with the body. And there are also professional organizations like the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, which creates peer-reviewed recommendations and guidelines targeted at helping clinicians decide if they have genetic data and they want to prescribe a medication, what's the right course of action? And there are some very prominent examples that I think many people can relate to where pharmacogenetics can have an impact in their medical care. So the first one I like to discuss is high cholesterol. So honestly, it's a low hanging fruit. A lot of people suffer from high cholesterol. In fact, over 30% of the population do in the United States. And that's important to recognize because this is a huge risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which is a leading cause of death. And if we focus on a population suffering from pancreatitis, high cholesterol is frequently comorbid with high triglycerides, which themselves are a risk factor for pancreatitis. What's also great about high cholesterol is that we can treat it pretty easily. In fact, we have uh, several classes of drugs. One that's quite prominent are the statin medications. So most likely you've heard of these, there's Zocor and Simvastatin, Lipitor, Mavacor, Crestor, a few others. They work pretty well. They raise the good cholesterol, they lower the bad cholesterol. And in most people, they're pretty well tolerated, very few side effects, if any. However, 
all of them have this potential to cause this sometimes annoying muscle pain, particularly localized to the legs. So it's always something we warn people about. If it's an issue and it's problematic, generally we'll want to lower the dose or change to another medication. In some people, that side effect will progress to something called rhabdomyolysis, which is a life-threatening condition that is driven by the same effect that causes the minor side effect. It's just when it gets really bad. In the case of simvastatin, there is a genetic variant in a single gene called SLCO1B1 that if we test for it, we can predict which patients are at slightly higher risk for that toxic effect and people who are at tremendously higher risk for that effect. And furthermore, it's actually pretty common. In fact, I would ballpark about 50% of the population carries at least one copy of the variant that can cause this. And that means that those people should take a lower dose of simvastatin if they take simvastatin, or, and what happens most of the time is we just recommend they take another drug, eliminate the possibility altogether, which is something we can do with pharmacogenomics. And on the flip side of that, we can determine what patients are at very low risk for this effect and know that we're relatively safe if we want to move to a higher dose of simvastatin in that group. So it's a matter of both predicting and deciding who should be on another medication and also providing peace of mind knowing that you are relatively low risk for this effect with simvastatin, a drug that's been around for a long time, works very well, and is generally pretty inexpensive. Another possibly more prominent example in many cases is the case with depression and really any condition where an antidepressant is used. So some brief things that, that make this really interesting and particularly a challenging field is that one, you know, depression is common, like high cholesterol. It's a, it's a pretty substantial part of the population that suffers from it. Compared to high cholesterol, it's a lot harder to treat. So we have many drugs and we know that among people who take medication for depression, many, in some cases, you could argue that most of them will not be successful on the first medication that they take. So that's one huge challenge within this field. The other issue is that when you're trialing a new antidepressant, you're talking four to six weeks before you see any effect. So if you can imagine you are newly diagnosed with depression or really anything else where these drugs are, are relevant, you start the drug, four to six weeks later, you find out that you don't have any benefit from taking that drug. So now you try a new drug, and start the process all over again. So four to six more weeks. And then sometimes people end up taking, you know, two, three, four, even more trials of an antidepressant before they find one that works for them. That's months up to around a year to find the right medication for you, which I would argue as a clinician is unacceptable. We have to do better when we select these types of medications. So incoming pharmacogenomics can tell us about some of these antidepressants if we can expect that a patient is going to metabolize it slower or faster than the general population. So here I've introduced a couple new metabolizer phenotypes, which really just fall in the middle. So we could say most people are going to belong to this normal metabolizer category, but some people will be intermediate, which means they're in between poor and normal or all the way down to poor. And the same goes for rapid and ultra rapid. Now, what we can do with that information is say if we have a medication that needs to go through a particular gene where the individual is a poor metabolizer, then we can say, well, that patient is less likely to need a higher dose. In fact, they're more likely to need a low dose of that medication because they're going to metabolize it much slower, meaning it will accumulate and it's more likely they'll have side effects. And again, some very prominent examples that many of you might have heard of before that are relevant to this particular case. Those drugs that I've listed here include Celexa, Effexor, Brintelix, but there's also tricyclic antidepressants, and all of these have several uses that are on-label and off-label, which I want to address briefly because I know that many people take SSRIs and tricyclic antidepressants to help with pain related to pancreatitis, particularly chronic pancreatitis. Now, what I think is interesting and, and what I would like you to take away from this in that aspect is that that is worth a conversation with your physician if you are interested in potentially starting one of those to treat that, that particular symptom. And the reason I say that is 
the information that I give here is, is primarily driven around the main indication for these drugs, which is depression and sometimes anxiety. However, it is still relevant to potentially consider those same recommendations for off-label uses of these medications. However, I can't tell you definitively because I don't know. And that is a pretty common theme within pharmacogenomics is there are many areas where we just don't know yet, but it's likely that we will within the next, I would say, 10 years. Which brings me to my final example that is probably most prominent in the I don't know sphere, which is pain management. So chronic pain is a significant problem as well. So excluding pancreatitis, a lot of people suffer from some sort of chronic pain, I'd say more than 20% within the United States. But specifically within pancreatitis, and especially chronic pancreatitis, chronic pain is clearly a hallmark symptom of it. And it's also one of the hardest things to treat. And there are some pretty well understood reasons for that. So pain is something that everyone experiences in their own way, the way we could describe it as subjective, and the way that clinicians understand it and go about treating it is also quite different. So pharmacogenomics has very long tried to help explain why there is so much variability in treating someone's pain and getting someone to a comfort level with pharmacotherapy alone. And where we are now is what I'd like to talk about briefly, but I also wanna focus on this last point that this is an evolving area because there's many folks, myself included, that are interested in further exploring how pharmacogenomics can help bridge that gap between what patients need and what we understand about figuring out what their variability will be. But here's what we do know. So I have listed here some examples. So we have codeine, trimidol, and a new drug called Olinvic, which is a newer IV opioid medication. So for those medications, we can use metabolizer phenotypes, and they can tell us one about codeine in about 10% of the population. Codeine just doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because codeine has to be turned into morphine in order to do what it's supposed to do. And again, in like 10, in some cases, 10 plus percent of the population, they can't turn codeine into morphine. So you don't get any pain relief when you take codeine. On the other hand, some people are ultra rapid metabolizers at the same particular gene. And in those people, codeine gets turned into morphine really fast. So they might have more side effects. On the other side, tramadol and olinvic have similar annotations, but they are more specifically targeted people who metabolize faster than usual. There's also some information that we know about non steroidal anti inflammatory medications. So these include over the counter medications like Advil, but also prescription drugs like Celebrex and Mobic. These medications can be affected by a poor metabolizer phenotype in another gene that can predict who is at higher risk for side effects. In the case of Advil, that's a very significant increased risk for gastric ulcers um, and sometimes gastrointestinal bleeding, which can be quite significant. And again, something that I, I wanna harp on is that these are common genetic variations. Like I myself have undergone pharmacogenomic testing and I know that I'm a poor metabolizer of ibuprofen. So I never take ibuprofen because, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have to, but I have before and it makes me sick. And that's not terribly uncommon. And there are many, many other examples that are relevant in this case. And following this webinar, you'll have access to a discussion guide that has a lot of information. I'll go through a little bit more of it in a few slides, but I do want to touch on where you can go to find more examples of what drugs might be relevant for pharmacogenomics. So again, quick thing, FDA calls it pharmacogenetics in many of their resources. In this context, it's synonymous. They have this table of pharmacogenetic associations. This is open to the public. It's a US government site. If you're in the US, your tax dollars pay for this. So it's nice to be aware that it's there. And they have lots of information about specifically what drugs what genes and the affected phenotypes, and sometimes they'll give more complex genotypes, along with what the description is for that particular case. So this table is important because when you are considering whether or not to undergo pharmacogenomic testing, 
These are the kinds of things that those pharmacogenomic tests will return. If they're not in this table, it's less likely that you will see specific information about that in whatever gets returned. But with the caveat that this table updates pretty frequently, and this field is expanding very rapidly. So even a year ago, this kind of information was much more sparse, but moving forward, you can expect to see many more drugs with relevant information and very specific recommendations about what to do based on genetics. So with that in mind, you might be wondering, great, how do I actually go about getting pharmacogenomic testing? And I know there are many places where you can get genetic testing done, and I am going to specifically not endorse any particular tests for or against. Um, but what I will focus on is this idea of tests that you order within a partnership with your provider. And so that narrows it down a bit and eliminates things like 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, even though those are perfectly you know, reasonable sources to use if you are you know, interested in maybe something informational, but it's not reasonable to expect that those are going to have the same clinical action ability that other pharmacogenomic tests might have like the ones that are listed here. So there are some that are exclusively pharmacogenomics. And so these are just some examples of some prominent companies. There are others, again, this isn't an endorsement or, or you know, saying that either one of these is better than the other. In fact, they're all very similar. However, I would recommend if you're interested, explore the offerings from OneOme, Admira, and Genomind, and of course, any others that you come across to see if there's any differences in, in particular drugs they focus on. Um, and also depending on what your provider wants. And it's also something you could consider as an add-on to other genetic tests. So an example with aerial precision medicine, we offer pharmacogenomic testing as an add-on to our core product, Pancreas DX. From a cost standpoint, most of these are quite similar. You can expect to find these to run anywhere from $100 to $1,000, but generally closer to around the $500 mark. And also if you're wondering, most of them are generally self-pay, Depending on your insurance, there might be some option for reimbursement. However, it is quite rare to find that. I do hope and, and pardon me, expect to see that change within the next few years as well as this field grows. Ultimately though, this is an important thing to drive a conversation with your provider about what the best option is for you and specifically if they have any recommendations. And, We've included this discussion guide, which again, you'll get this after the webinar, that one has a summary of what we've talked about today. Importantly, resources. So it'll link you out to that FDA table that I showed you. So it has the URL for that. Um, and it also has information about another resource, which is CPIC that I mentioned earlier. Uh, some brief facts about pharmacogenomic testing and what it can offer for you. And specifically, and, and the way we've intended this is to help you lead a conversation with your provider about what pharmacogenomic testing could do for you and ways you can go about getting that testing and, and owning your data and being able to use it in your daily clinical or routine clinical practice. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'll, I'll turn it back over and I'm, I'm happy to hear your questions. Great, uh, Dr. Adams, thank you so much for giving us an overview of how an individual's genetic makeup can impact uh, how well specific medicines work for them. Uh, for me particularly, I especially uh, really like the examples you shared with us. Um, and it's quite comforting to know that this is a regulated field uh, that'll continue to grow and give us uh, nuanced insights to help uh, find precise medicines for each one of us. So uh, very thankful. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Avi, and I lead patient-centered care efforts at Mission Cure to make specialized coordinated care accessible for all individuals living with pancreatitis. Uh, and today I'll be facilitating the Q&A session with Dr. Adams. Um, so please, if you have a question, feel free to type them in the Q&A section in your webinar window. Uh, just a quick note that Dr. Adams will not be able to provide any specific medical advice to you. Um, if you have a, a question related to your specific medical condition, we encourage you to talk to your provider, um, especially with the discussion guide that uh, Dr. Adams just shared. I think it can be a good resource. Um, so uh, I guess I'll just get uh, started with the, the questions, Dr. Adam. Uh, there have been a few that have been coming in ahead of the webinar as well. Uh, 
Uh, and so this is an individual uh, who has idiopathic chronic pancreatitis with EPI. Um, and the question is, how can I be certain my medications are working properly and being absorbed? Great, thank you, Avia. And, and that's a really good question because it incorporates, it gets at the heart of, of something that I want to clarify within pharmacogenomics as well is that this is one of many tools that providers can use to help better target individual medications. Um, so pharmacogenomics standing by itself can provide information like what we talked about specifically regarding to who's at higher risk for adverse events, who needs different dosing or alternative drugs. Knowing information about if you have EPI and specifically the degree to that insufficiency can also play an important role in understanding basically how any medication, particularly one that's driven by you know, needs for absorption, uh, you know, there are some medications that absorption is highly limited or facilitated by the, you know, same pathways that allow things like fats and lipids to be absorbed from a meal. So all of that information should be considered. So genetics can be another adjunctive way to support even incorporating just knowing that you have EPI and, and, and better targeting medication use. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question that we have is, and you touched upon this a little bit in the start of your presentation, how does pharmacogenomics testing differ from therapeutic drug monitoring? Right. So ideally, pharmacogenomic testing is potentially an adjunctive use to therapeutic drug monitoring. So just to, to define this briefly, so therapeutic drug monitoring, we call it TDM, refers to if you receive a medication and you might get blood draws or some other test to determine what's the concentration of that drug in your body. So it is a real-time predictor or determinant of how fast your body is metabolizing a drug and how fast it's eliminating that drug. So sometimes we have to use PM with any use of, of certain medications, particularly some IV medications or blood thinners or anticoagulants like warfarin, where we have to monitor the effect of the drug. So those tools are generally used once you're already taking a medication, whereas with pharmacogenomics, ideally the test information is available before you start the medication. So most of the time you would use pharmacogenomics say prior to starting the drug. And then if TDM is recommended for that medication, you would still receive therapeutic drug monitoring later on. Right. Uh, one, uh, in one of your example slides, you touched on this, you talked about individuals having different metabolizer types, uh, and you talked about the four different uh, options there. So for an individual, being a fast or a slow metabolizer, is that specific to each drug or to a class of drugs? Right. Another really great question. Thank you, Avi. So metabolizer phenotypes are generally drug specific. There are very few instances where multiple drugs in a single class would be entirely metabolized through the same pathway. Even though there might be overlap, generally when we refer to poor metabolizer or any sort of metabolizer phenotype, we are referring to a specific drug and sometimes a very specific gene drug pair. Okay, um, that's great. Um, so. Here's a, here's a question. If you're a pancreatitis patient and your doctor wants to give you a pain medicine that you know hasn't been effective for you in the past, um, should you request pharmacogenomic testing? How long does it typically take to get these results? Great. So ideally, you have the information before. In a perfect world, we would all have that information before we had to deal with finding out that a drug didn't work. In that case, pharmacogenomic testing could be appropriate from the standpoint of it can provide validation, although it might not. And even so, if a medication didn't work for you, then it didn't work for you. So, you know, in an ideal model, everybody has this information before they get any medication so that if you have relevant information that can drive that decision, then you can kind of play in this area of clinical action ability, which is what we're always going for whenever we do any sort of a clinical test, because it's not just about, you know, being informative, it's about having information that you can do something with. So in that case, I wouldn't say don't get testing just because you might not be able to use it because 
it still helps you to maybe understand why and, and maybe understand other potential drugs that might go through that same pathway. Um, but regardless, even if the test came back and it said that pharmacogenomics doesn't predict that you'll have an issue with this drug, the fact is the drug didn't work for you. So there might be something else that is not genetics, or it could be something within your genetics that we don't know about yet. Right. Yes, I think the two points that I just want to underscore. One is even if you don't get information about that specific drug, it still gives you information that might be helpful in the future uh, mm. for other potential uh, drugs. But and also uh, because it's a growing field, it it is some that information might become available uh, in the next few years. So we'll have to sort mm -hmm. of keep a close watch on it. Um, Another um, related question, I guess, to my previous one, and this is a sticky one that uh, I, I'm sure you've heard uh, before. What can you do when you've approached your doctor and they refuse to prescribe any kind of testing? What advice would you have for mm -hmm. our patients who have had that experience? That's a good question. And so I can tell you my other world with pharmacogenomics is, is primarily working with providers. So I, I work with pharmacists, physicians, and others to help educate them about how to use pharmacogenomics. Um, you know, we very frequently use, I, I think some would call it a scare tactic, but we talk to physicians and we say, one day you are going to have patients asking you about genetic test results, or they're going to ask you for genetic testing that might have to do with pharmacogenomics or something that is, you know, more routine. Um, and many of them are, are you know, quite hesitant and, and it's understandable because genetics is a newer field and really depending on where your provider has, has come from and what their experience has been, they might be more or less hesitant to order testing or, or use the data. You know, a couple of things about pharmacogenomics that I think um, you know, we focus on and can clarify is that the majority of these tests, in fact, I would argue that almost all tests for pharmacogenomics are not in risk areas. So we're not going to incidentally return your risk for some other disease state or necessitate you know, a, a bunch of new diagnostic testing based on the results. They are in genes that are not consequential based on these variants, as far as we know, um, aside from their changes in drug metabolism. So that's one thing we try to clarify. And you can try having a conversation with your provider about that if they're not aware of it. Alternatively, Many of the companies that I listed before and most offer testing or, or rather you can initiate an order process that will be approved by a clinician who works with that company or one that they contract with. So even if you aren't able or even if you don't necessarily want to go through your provider, you can work through one of their providers to obtain a prescription for the test and still get it the same way. So actually just building on that question, if a patient chooses to do that, uh, can you comment a little bit on the, you know, when they go through the testing, they get a report back. Um, is that something that uh, a patient uh, or a caregiver of a patient understand and make sense of? Uh, because, you know, there is that next step, okay, what am I going to do with this information? And mm -hmm. what can I, how can I make it actionable for my particular situation? Can you comment a little bit on that next step as well? Right. So that will, a lot of that will depend on your own comfort level with what, what, how much you can take from it. In general, the reports that are returned by these companies are fairly straightforward. It, you know, they, they are generally targeted towards clinicians, but most patients can, can, find understanding of the information that's there. Like I can tell you, if you can, you know, make it through the FDA table or CPIC and, and have kind of some base understanding of what it's saying, then you'll most likely be comfortable with the language that comes back in the report. Um, you know, the important thing within pharmacogenomics is generally, you know, our target audience, while it's clinicians, it's not, it's clinicians who aren't experts in genetics. So many of them might be even on the same page as you as far as their level of comfort with interpreting it. So when we develop the reports, we know that. So we try to make them as you know, clear as, as this is what the immediate recommendation would be. But then in addition, here are some future considerations about other medications. Um, so the other thing you can do is, is if you want to see what a company's report looks like, most of these have an option where you can request a sample report. So you can know what it's going to look like when it comes back for you. And if it comes back and it says something or, or it doesn't look like it's you know, to your level or, or, or covers the medications that you are interested in knowing about, then it's probably not the best decision for you. 
Um, and the same with the genetic information. While they're always going to include some of the more deep complex genetic data, usually in the appendices, that information is not usually necessary in order to follow the recommendations that are coming back from that particular report. Yeah, and you know, just for our listeners, I just wanna uh, underscore the point as Dr. Idem said, that these reports are really intended for uh, providers and clinicians uh, and, and not intended for patients to adjust their own medication doses. Uh, that needs to be done at the direction of the, of the provider. Uh, but uh, so that's just underscoring that point, but uh, that was super helpful, uh, Dr. Adams. Um, we have uh, another question coming up and this is related to an earlier question. Uh, about how does absorption play a role with medication for someone with uh, gastroparesis? Um, right. And would testing be of any value in, in those situations? Yeah, and absolutely. So all of those, whether it's EPI or it's gastroparesis, or even if it's if you've had small bowel resection or um, pancreatectomy or any of those conditions, all of those can have their own unique impacts on drug absorption that can be quite significant. For pharmacogenomics, there are many genes that we know about. Some of them haven't quite made it into the kind of level of making a clinical recommendation based on what we know but we know that genetics itself can alter medication absorption within the intestines. So all of that information should be coordinated with various providers so that they know exactly what to consider. So I guess the short answer is yes, it's always going to be relevant. It has to be taken in consideration with other clinical factors. And I'll be just to, again, highlight that point because I'm, I'm glad you brought that up is that you know, nobody should be adjusting their medication doses or what they decide to take until they talk to their provider. Um, you know, one thing within pharmacogenomics is it's if, especially if you were on a medication where you're on a stable dose, if hypothetically you've got pharmacogenomic testing and it told you that you needed a different dose than you were taking for that medication, well then pharmacogenomic testing is, is not helpful there. You shouldn't adjust to that dose. You should stay with the dose that you are currently taking. Um, and that's, that's a common sticking point for whenever you receive these results is really the intention for the vast majority of cases is for patients who are starting a new medication to help eliminate that trial and error period. Um, this is a, a more sort of what to expect kind of a question. So one of our patients wants to know what does it mean to be uh, tested? Uh, what does it involve and um, how long does it take to get the results? Great. So for most of these that I've talked about today, this would be a kit that would get mailed to your house and there'll either be a spit kit where you'll spit in a tube, seal it up and mail it back. Um, there might be a swab that you would rub on the inside of your cheek and then put that in a tube and send it back. Um, and, and that's a pretty common procedure because it, it works and you can do it through the mail and you don't have to go anywhere to have um, anything taken. In those cases, for most tests, it's about four to six weeks. It could be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, depending on the company, but most can give you more specific information about their turnaround time. There are other examples of tests that you can get that are a little less, that you are less likely to encounter unless you're in a very specific scenario. Um, so I'll give one example um, with a drug called clopidogrel or Plavix. Um, where many, especially academic medical centers, have pharmacogenomic testing that they will do for that specific drug if you are going to have a percutaneous coronary intervention or a stent placed following something like a heart attack. Um, in those cases, the test results come back much sooner because they, they have to in order to decide which antiplatelet agent you should get following that procedure. Um, but in those cases, it's more likely to be a blood draw that you would have while you're either in the emergency department or in the cath lab. Um, again, it's a very unique scenario, but there are a few like that, but those are less likely to be tests that you will be able to, um, that there'll be tests that'll be initiated by the clinician versus what you would be looking for on your own. Got it. Um, well, um, I think that's all the questions we have today. Um, I know it is, at least for me, uh, jogging, you know, a lot of questions and, you know, ways that I want to be thinking about this. And uh, I know I'm excited as this field continues to grow to not only help us develop cure therapies for pancreatitis, but I believe also for uh, care uh, strategies. And, and as we said earlier, to establish precision medicine uh, 
uh, therapies for individuals who are dealing with pancreatitis, but also other uh, uh, conditions. So uh, thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. We have many other informative and educational resources coming down the pipeline. Uh, as part of our patient education program. So please stay in touch with us, social media, our website, and our newsletter. Uh, a big thanks to Dr. Adams and the Ariel team for sharing how our genetic makeup impacts how medicines work for us. Um, we would like uh, to ask you to please fill out a brief survey after you leave the webinar. It'll pop up automatically on your browser. It'll take just a couple of minutes to complete. Uh, your feedback really helps us get better and also surface topics that are of most interest to you all. So I really encourage you to take a couple of minutes to share your input. Um, as far as logistics, uh, once again, you'll be receiving a recording of this webinar uh, as well as a printable discussion guide uh, that you can use uh, to speak with your provider about your options. Um, if you have any questions, uh, our virtual door is always open, uh, so please be in touch. And once again, thanks for joining us today and have a lovely rest of your day.